God is calling us to come and join the story, to come and play our part. When God asks us, whom shall I send? Can we say, here I am, send me, Lord. As we draw near to you, Lord, God, we remember how you approached your first disciples. By the lake, we follow you as they did captivated and in awe at being caught up in your story. Father, we want to follow you. Guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, forgive us for being less than we might be, for following half-heartedly when his son calls us. Afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us in the world and to bring out the extraordinary within our nature, accept then this forgiveness and this call to shine. Step from the shadows now and follow in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask my brother uh, Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God. And um, today there are quite a number of readings. The first one comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 13. And the second one comes from Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And uh, the third one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11 as well. I'll ask my brother to come and do the reading. God bless you. Good morning and praise God. Uh, hope you're all well and looking towards the Lord for our strength in this time. Um, I'll get straight into it. Isaiah 6, one, just Isaiah 6, a whole lot. In the year that King Uzzah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraph, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voice, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among an, a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with the tongue, with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understand. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of his people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie in ruins and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged until the Lord had sent any, every one far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be a stump in the land. Praise God. Luke 5, 1 to 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw, saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, then uh, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deeper water 
and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled their partners in, uh, partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knee, knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Uh, lastly, 1 <coughs> first, first Corinthians 15, yep. 1 to 11. Mm. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By the gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether, then, it was I and they, that it uh, then, uh, sorry, this is what we have preached and this is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord for this week. It's also the sermon, so we won't need to get Johnson back because I've done the hour sermon. <laughs> no, let's get him back and hear this awesome, awesome uh, word of God. Praise God. Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. Um, I'm here again. And to, today I'm going to share with you on the theme, the kind of people whom God chooses. The kind of people whom God chooses. Our lesson for the day talk about three men who experienced God's grace in extraordinary ways. Uh, these men are Isaiah, uh, and then we've got Simon Peter. We also have got Paul. The apostle. It is interesting how similar their stories are despite their different stations in the Bible. There are many stories in the Bible about people who are called to serve God and follow Jesus. Remember the story about Paul. He was persecuting the church, dragging Christians out of their houses, condemning them to death. One day he saw the light and it knocked him off his horse. It's hard to relate to such a dramatic conversation, conversion. But there it is. Remember the story about Matthew. One day he was sitting at his tax collection table, minding his own business and counting the change. All of a sudden, Jesus looked at him and said, Get in and step in and follow me. Matthew didn't take time to think about it. He stood up and went. It is difficult to understand such an abrupt decision, but there it is. Remember the story of Nathaniel. His brother Philip told him about Jesus in John 1 verse 43 to 51. It sounded interesting until Philip said, And here is from Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of that one donkey town? Suddenly Nathaniel began to state a Christological formulation. Rabbi, you are the son of God and the king of Israel. 
It is curious to hear about such instant orthodox, but there it is. But the call of Simon Peter, that story is far more satisfying. The way Luke tells it, Simon wasn't sure that he fit into the whole Jesus business. It took time for him to figure it out. Even then, he had some misgivings. Did you hear what he said? Get away from me, Lord. I am not a good enough person for you. That's the way Luke tells it. If you listen to the Gospel of Matthew or Luke Mark, the story is much shorter. Jesus said, come and follow me. Immediately, Simon Peter dropped his net on the sand and off he went. No question is that. No doubts in his mind. No inner conflict. No sense of inadequacy. Immediately went. But as Luke tells the story, it sounds like it could have happened to you or to me. By the time Jesus gets to the beach in chapter 5, he has already been to Simon Peter's house. He went there after preaching a sermon one day. Simon's mother-in-law hadn't heard the sermon. He's, she stayed home with a very high fever. And they asked Jesus about her. So Luke says he stood over her and screamed at the headache. The headache left her. So she got up and made some soup. Jesus went to that house long before he ever mentioned a job change to Simon Peter. And there is no telling Simon would have taken it anyway. Who wants a boss who screams at your mother-in-law's headache? Then Jesus went down to the lake to preach on the beach. It would have been a serene place to hear a sermon, but there was a crowd pressing against him. So he climbed into Simon's boat, pushed out from shore, and began to speak some more. All of this happened before he said, come and follow me. And after Jesus finished speaking, they pushed themselves into real deep water. Jesus proved himself to be the first in a long line of preachers who could offer some ad advice on fishing. It didn't sound like good advice, and Simon said in such, said much. But Jesus insisted. They threw in their nets, and the catch was unbelievable. Fish began to swim into the nets and jump into the boat. There were so many fish, the boat began to sink while Jesus was still in it. Somebody whistled to the shore, get another boat out here so we can save the Savior. It was a silly thing to say for one thing, there were too many fish and too little deck space. For another, a Savior doesn't need much saving. So the other boat came out anyway. The fish began to jump that into that boat. The boat began to sink. Next thing you know, all these men began to yell at one another. Get these boats to the shore. Peter was on his knees, absolutely insulted in amazement. Then they said the first truly intelligent thing. You shall say it all day. Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He's realizing because he told Jesus that he had toiled all night and caught nothing. So how could he just maybe being asked in two minutes to say, just go to the deeper end and throw the nets? While he's, they've told all night and nothing happened. If you ask me, that is a story that I can understand. It's not particularly dramatic, abrupt, or instant. Instead, it is time-consuming, unfinished, and it smells like a fish story. At a moment when Simon Peter, the fisherman, gets the cage of the century, he wants to push away the founder of the founders. And who came? Who blame him? He's now saying, get away from me. I'm a sinful person. He's now trying to deal with him to say, move away from me. The church has manufactured its own mythology about the first disciples. We have spun tales about their grounded faith and their perfect understanding. We want to believe that they, their collective act together. We want to affirm them as competent and capable, always knowing the correct answer or to a question or the perfect solution to a problem. But that was not the case. The 12 disciples were ordinary people like you and me. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a whole lot better. Following Christ is difficult enough. It is an awesome task to live as God's person in a world like this. It is even 
ways when you are a leader, like myself, under the scrutiny of others, with the demands they put you to lead a rugged architecture, who among us is qualified to lead, let alone follow? Who among us has enough holy traits or a few enough bad habits? Not one. According to the Bible, all kinds of people have said so. Abraham said, I'm too old <laughs> when he was called. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. Moses said, I don't talk so good. Mary said, I'm only a woman. God never hears any new excuses. He never hears. Woe to me, Isaiah cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a life core in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Can you see the man who was talking about his unclean lips? But when he had an encounter with God, his life was changed and is now willing to say, Send me. And St. Paul writes, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. That is what Paul is saying. Because I persecuted the church of God. Then Paul adds, but by the grace of God, I am what I am today. We are all not perfect. Simon Peter pulled in a load of fish and said, Lord, get out of here. I can't handle this. It is too much for me to take in. I am not the kind of person who can handle such generosity. I am not good enough to have you in my body. Call him, if you will, the patron saint of inadequacy. Simon Peter stands in a long biblical tradition. These days, the church still squabbles about who is good enough to save the Lord. Who is good enough? When that happens, I suggest we read the Bible. Nobody is good enough. Look at the people, whom, the kind of people whom God chooses. None of us are good enough, but God wants us anyway. This is not to say the work is easy. Jesus said, I want to invite you to give up fish to go fishing. <laughs> to give up what you're doing to go fishing. Ever since the time of Jeremiah, whenever anybody talked about going fishing, it was a metaphor for doing God's work. When Jesus said, go fish, he meant to gather in as many fish as we could so that God alone can sort out the good and the bad. Ultimately, God alone can decide what to keep and what to throw back. So we can't judge who are the perfect Christians and who are not the perfect Christians. It's only Jesus who can do that. Only God can do that, not us. Our task is to bring as many people into the house of God. Whoever, who, who, whoever they are from their own walks of life, let us bring them to God. It is only God who can do it. For our part, we are called upon to throw out the net as far as we can. And then see what happens. So the first word he speaks is, don't be afraid. We can be amazed, painful aware of the problems we face and the limitations we know. Yet he says to us, don't be afraid. It is Christ's call, Christ's work, and Christ's miracle. He's the only one who can do that. So the invitation doesn't begin or end with us. The one who calls us is the one who knows that he only has imperfect people to call. For our part, we simply have to decide if we are to go out of the boat once we land on the shore. Our task is to go out and bring people to God in their imperfection. Who they are. As Joseph Fisman points out, when Simon says, go and leave me, Simon acknowledges that Jesus is rooted in a room or a sphere to which he himself does not belong. Number two, 
The only one who calls us in the midst of inadequacy is the one who ultimately judges us adequate. None of us are ever good enough, but God is good enough. And that's where we must start and finish. God is good enough. Always look at yourself as someone who is a sinner, saved by the grace of God. The people who should scare us most are the people who answer the call of Christ with such smug self-confidence that they know exactly what they are going to do. The person who thinks that she or he has all the answer frightens me. Like some of the people in this generation, you tell them about something and they always respond, I know. <laughs> I know. There's nothing they don't know. Everything they know. Those people frighten me. People like that are scary because they follow their own agenda and do not pursue what is most health for the whole body of Christ. A self-righteous servant is a contradiction to ter in terms. The only person whom God can use and by this, I mean the only person is the person who can hold humility in one hand and in the other confidence in the gospel which redeems us. Humility in one hand. And my confidence is not in myself, it's in the word of God. That is where, what is important. So the Lord asks, us, whom shall I say? Who will go for us? Isaiah cries out, here I am, send me. The very person who was saying, who to me, I'm a person of unclean lips, is now saying, send me. Jesus says to the frightened Simon Peter, I will make you <clears throat> a fish of men. And immediately he follows after the master. And St. Paul acknowledges that because he persecuted the Christians, he was the least of the apostles. But he adds that by God's grace, he worked harder than any of them. So that's what happens when we have an encounter with the living God. It is the most important encounter we'll ever have, giving our lives completely to Christ. If you can picture these three different stories in different places, three men who have been changed by God, even us, any one of us can be changed by God. There is no one beyond the grace of God. Anyone can be changed. And when, when we come before God, <clears throat> we always come as unrighteous people. And you always live again as unrighteous people. Every day of my life, I always have to confess and say, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. Because we sin by the way we talk. We sin by the way we walk. We sin by just our behavior. So we are sinners saved by the grace of God. So who are we to claim the righteousness which is not ours? Only is bestowed on us by God. May the good Lord help us as we think upon these words, as we meditate upon these words, and see the kind of people whom God chooses. Ordinary people, just like you and me. May God bless you, so that you really know that you are part of the team that God is calling. God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Father, we praise you for allowing your kingdom to break through into our lives for the things that you are ordinary, <clears throat> but to us are extraordinary. And we thank you that you have called us to be part of your story. Ordinary people caught up in extraordinary tale of your plan of salvation. The best matter of our astonished natures turned to gold in your hands. I am not even worthy to stand here before preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It is only you who have made it happen. Bless us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers, I also, and sisters, it's time for us to make our offering.
or to give our offering. So I would ask every one of us, those who feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to participate in this ministry of giving, it's now time for you to make your giving. Let us pray for the offering. Father, we come before you with our offering. We know, Father, that sometimes we forget that all the gifts that we have comes from you. But today, at this stage, you are just reminding us that it's not enough to worship you without thanking you. So we come with our offering just to say thank you, Lord. May you bless our offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. <clears throat> Loving God, give us grace to live for your kingdom so that the whole earth will join with the song of angels, praising your name and blessing you forever. The whole earth is full of your glory of God and is saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all from now and evermore. Amen. <clears throat>